Let's pray. Lord, we love you for your goodness and your grace toward us. Thank you that we have a relationship with you. Lord, I pray this morning as we study your word, something supernatural happens. And I pray for every heart in this room, my own included, Lord God, that we're not here today to just assimilate information, that we don't approach the Bible like a textbook, God, but that we are here today to let the Spirit of God breathe life into our hearts and into our understanding. That in the way that you reveal yourself to these two disciples today, reveal yourself to us. Because you're here. Lord, we don't want to be that church that we see in the book of Revelation that's gathered together, but you're on the outside knocking on the door to be let in and nobody even knows. We want you right here, front and center, of everything we do, Jesus. So we lift up this time to you today. We pray that you speak to our hearts. Build us up as your church for your glory, for your name's sake. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Okay, Luke chapter 24. Now we're just going to kind of blow through the opening verses here because the opening verses just give us the setting or the occasion, the context. This is right after Jesus Christ has been crucified. It's the day he has risen from the dead. Easter Sunday, we might think of it. It says on the first day of the week, verse 1, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them. Who are the they? We're told later in this passage that it's Mary Magdalene, it's Mary, the mother of James, Joanna, and then there's other women too. They don't really come into what we're looking at too much today But they and certain other with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared, but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. So they went in, verse 3, and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, as you would be, right? That, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, the two men, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here but he is risen. Praise the Lord. We serve a risen Savior like the old hymn goes, right? He's alive. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. That's the truth of it. He's not here, verse 6, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified in the third day rise again, and they remembered his words. Now, I I think it's important for us to go ahead and note at this part of the Bible study, there's not a single mention of any of Jesus' disciples who were expecting him to come back to life from the dead. Okay, we're we're looking at a group of people this morning, and and the two disciples on the road to Emmaus will be a good example of that. We're looking at people this morning whose hopes were dashed Right? They, they thought Jesus was it, man, which he was, but when he died, like, that was it. They, there's not a single mention in that three-day period between the death and burial of Christ and before his resurrection, not a single disciple was like, guys, it's okay. Three days, he's going to be back to life again. They had given up. All hope, they had, in their minds and hearts, lost everything. Jesus Christ, to them, was not, at this point, did not seem to be the Messiah that they thought he was going to be, because now he's dead. He's been put to death. It didn't make sense. But they remembered his words, verse 8, and they returned from the tomb, verse 9, and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, and here's where we're told the names of some of these women, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to to the apostles, and their words seemed to them like idle tales. The word there is nonsense. These hysterical women, right, coming back from the grave, and they don't know what they're talking about, right? They're going on about something, about Jesus' body being taken away. They didn't believe them, verse 11, but, verse 12, Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. So this is the occasion. It's the day of Jesus' resurrection. The tomb is empty. 
And now Jesus is going to appear to these two, to these two disciples. Again, one of them named Cleopas, who really is only mentioned in this part of the Bible. We don't know much about this man, Cleopas. And, and actually, if I can, let, let me just go ahead and, and make this point as we get into the study this morning. One of the things that I find really encouraging about this passage is so often, you know, we read the Bible and we read about Peter's encounters with Jesus or the Apostle Paul or John, or we think about people like Billy Graham or, uh, you know, Francis Chan or, or any of these sort of great spiritual leaders down through the ages, and we somehow think that it has something to do with them. And it doesn't. It's about Jesus. And one of the things that I find so cool about this passage this morning is that Jesus appears personally to these two virtually unknown disciples. We have to be really, really careful within the Christian community of the rock star mentality. That somehow, because a person is who they are, that God's working in their life somehow because of them. It's like when James is writing about Elijah praying. He says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed. See, what God did in and through the ministry of Elijah wasn't because it was Elijah, it's because he prayed. It's because he had a relationship with God. He knew the living God. And that's the key. You don't, you don't have to have a million followers on Twitter, right? You don't have to have your book on the shelves of the Christian bookstore. You don't have to go on a speaking tour. You're a child of God. You if you've given your heart and life to Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ wants to do something real and living and powerful and personal in your life today, right now. I hope that you came here this morning wanting and expecting to have, as we've given the name of this series, an encounter with Jesus, to meet him, not just hear about him, but to meet him and to go away the way these disciples will at the end of the account with your heart burning because Jesus ministered to you. See, that's what we need. The personal ministry of Jesus in our lives. Okay, so let's pick it up there in verse 13. Now behold, two of them, two of the ones that the women came back to and were sharing that the body wasn't there and they thought was nonsense, two of them, we read in verse 13, were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And verse 14, and they talked together of all these things which had happened. Okay, so they're talking about current events, right? In verse 14, what are all the things which had happened that they're talking about? Well, they're talking about the ministry of Jesus. Perhaps they're reminiscing about the miracles he had performed. They're certainly talking about his arrest, his betrayal, his beating, his scourging, his execution, them laying him to rest in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. They're, look, for all intents and purposes, what you have in this passage this morning are two Christians talking about Christian stuff, right? You've got two followers of Jesus, and they're talking about the latest worship conference that they went to. They're talking about the latest hit single on Christian radio. They're talking about the latest book that they've read that they picked up, the bestseller. And, and they're just they're walking along, two Christians talking about all kinds of Christian stuff. And here's the crazy thing. Jesus is going to scoot right up next to them, and they don't even recognize him. You can have an understanding of Christian stuff, right? You can be focused on Christian stuff. You can have a Christian bumper sticker, Christian t-shirts, listen to Christian music, and then Jesus tries to saunter up next to you, and you don't even see who it is. Wow. Let's look at this passage together. Verse 14, they talked together of all these things which had happened, and so it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Verse 16, but their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. I think, by the way, this is a great 
little snapshot of the truth of Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there. Look, that, you know, that's not just like spiritual smoke that we blow to make one another feel good about Christian gatherings. You know, isn't it, don't we do that sometimes with the Bible? To kind of make ourselves feel good? We go, well, there are two or more, you know. Eh. And Jesus is right there, and we don't even know it. The other night, we were praying with our kids, and, you know, when we, when we pray with our kids, we just really try to encourage our kids to talk to Jesus about whatever is on their mind. You know, if they're, if they're sad about something, if they're happy about something, if they're thankful for something, if they're angry about something, we're just like, just tell it to Jesus. Because, you know, so often, and you know, this happens even in adult prayer meetings, we go around the room and we go, who's got a prayer request? And this person says, oh, this, 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 and then we say, okay, let's pray. And crickets, right? And we're more than happy to tell each other our prayer requests, but what we need to do is be able to talk to Jesus. And we're in the middle of praying, and, and, and I'm, I'm praying, and my son, you know, Kaysen, who's four, he, he leans over and he goes, Dad, I'm, I'm, I'm sad about the patch on my arm. And I said, Kaysen, don't tell me. Tell Jesus. And he goes, dear Lord Jesus. I said, Kaysen, just talk to him the way you're talking to me. I said, the same way you leaned over and said, Dad, I'm sad about the scratch on my arm. I said, just say, Jesus, I'm sad about the scratch on my arm. And it was just, you could kind of see the light bulb going off. He was like, is it really that easy? Yeah, it is. Our prayers do not have to be these long, eloquent, theologically sound, doctrinally filled, right? You know what I mean? Somebody once said it's not the length of our prayers, it's the strength of our prayers. Good example, Peter's walking on water, right? He's walking on water, doing this amazing thing. He takes his eyes off Jesus, and he starts to sink. But what Peter doesn't do is bow his heads and you know, bow his head and close his eyes, and dear Lord Jesus, if thou wouldest, please reach forth thy hand. And if you tried to do that, it'd be like, dear, you know, he just, he just said, Lord, save me. And then Jesus, boom, gets him out. That's a great prayer. God, help. When I had my really bad car accident last year, you know, man, when I got T-boned by a huge truck as I was going through an intersection and the car spun around and flipped over, I was not like, dear Lord Jesus, would you please? I was like, Jesus, save me! <laughs> I was. They, they said to me, they were like, do you remember anything in the car? I was like, I remember screaming out to Jesus to save my life. That was my prayer. I don't even know how I got talking about prayer this morning. But Jesus, I guess what I, where I got on that was just talking about the fact that Jesus is here. You know, sometimes we go to church and it's like we're talking about George Washington. We could open a textbook about George Washington and we could put pictures of George Washington on the screen. And let's all talk about George Washington. We're talking about a living, and I mean this word in the most reverent sense, we're talking about a living person with a capital P who is here right now. I'm talking about Jesus, and he's right here. So I'm praying that he's like listening, going, mm hmm, that's good. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm hoping that, you know, my prayer is, Lord, you know, you got to give me what to say because we're talking, you're here, right? And these two disciples are walking along, talking about Christian stuff, talking about current affairs. And Jesus walks up, and they don't even see him. I mean, they see him, but they don't know it's Jesus. We read there in verse 16, their eyes were restrained. That word restrained, it, it means to hold in check or to seize and not let go. Whether it was something going on with them, which I have a tendency to think it is, based on what we'll talk about later in the passage, or whether it was the Lord supernaturally keeping their eyes closed, so to speak, whatever the reason, they don't recognize Jesus. Now, this is in sharp contrast to a passage like Mark chapter 6, where as Jesus comes into a region, it says they all recognized him. In your life this morning with Christ, 
Here's just kind of the question. Is there restraint or is there recognition? Are you a person, are you a child of God, a Christian, a believer, who, when the Lord draws near, you recognize it? Or are you the type of believer, Christian, child of God, churchgoer, who's very aware of stuff and things, but when the Lord himself tries to draw near, you don't even see it? Oh, that we would all be believers who, when the Lord draws near, we recognize him. We see his hand at work. We're walking in an awareness of his presence. Because he himself has promised never to leave us, nor forsake us. And by the way, that's why the Bible says we can be content with such things as we have. Because in Christ, all things that pertain to life and godliness have been given to us. There is nothing more that you need because you have Jesus and Jesus Christ is God's everything. Isn't that amazing? So often we're looking beyond Jesus. We're looking for something in addition to Jesus. There's competing affections with Jesus instead of just Jesus. And he's here. And he approaches and he wants to work and communi- in your life and communicate with you. Is there restraint or is there recognition? Do we see it? Are we aware of it? Or is there something that kind of blinds us to the reality that, oh, this is all real. And that Jesus is real. Their eyes are restrained, verse 16, so that they did not know him. Verse 17, and Jesus says to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? So that clues us into their state of mind. They are sad because of what has happened up to this point. Again, Jesus Christ, at this point, from their estimation, is dead. He's passed from the scene. You know, the buzz that had sort of been stoking their lives and all this exciting stuff, the miracles, right? It's all come to a crashing halt, and they're sad, and they're walking along, and they're talking, and Jesus comes up, and he says, what are you guys talking about? Which I love because Jesus already knows what they're talking about. Verse 18, so one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered and said to him, and you just, you know, I mean, this is just so funny to me. Are are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened here, there these days? And Jesus in verse 19 says, what things? Yeah, you got to wonder, like, what was the expression on Jesus' face? These guys are walking along. Oh, I can't believe he's gone. Do you remember that time he turned water into wine? That was amazing. Remember when he walked on water? And Jesus comes up. He says, what are you guys talking about? Who, who are you? What rock have you been living under? Have you not heard about what happened? In, haven't you heard about this stuff? What stuff? And it's like we talked about on Father's Day. Remember when Jesus meets the father whose son is possessed of the demon? And Jesus says to him, how long has this been going on? Jesus already knows the answer to the question, so why is he asking? To draw it out of them. To get them to open their heart to him. See, that's what Jesus wants from us. Now, people a lot of times will say, well, if the Lord already already knows what we have need of before we ask, why, why even pray? So you can have a relationship. So you can open your heart to him. So that you can communicate. Not because he doesn't know, he hasn't gotten the memo. But because he wants to know you. Again, my kids are a great example of this. You know, it's like, I'll, I'll, I'll see, you know, one of my kids something and like throw it you know across and I'm just picking up I'm just using an illustration pick up something and just kind of throw it you know and it knocks something over and and I go in there all three of my kids you know and I go in there and I say who did this you know and it's like the old was it family circus where there was the little kind of ghostly figure called not me you know who was always doing stuff because they were all be like not me 
you know, and I'll go into the room and I'll like look at three, all three of my kids and I'll go, who did this? And they'll look at each other and like, are you talking to us, dad? Oh, I, there's a poltergeist. You know, that cup of water just kind of fell over and I'm asking them because I want them to communicate with me so they know they can trust me and so that we can have a relationship. You understand? That's Jesus. Jesus comes along to these disciples. What are you guys talking about? Good grief. Who, are you an idiot? Haven't you heard about what happened? All the stuff. What, what stuff exactly? Just kind of talk to me about what's going on. So they said to him, about halfway through verse 19, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth. So here they are talking to Jesus about Jesus, and they don't even recognize Jesus. I mean, doesn't this like cause you to just kind of like take an inward look and go, do I ever talk about Jesus and what happens with Jesus, but I don't even know I'm talking to Jesus. I mean, here they are, they're talking about Jesus with Jesus, and they don't even know it's Jesus. It's crazy. So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed in word before God and all the people, verse 20, how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and, and crucified him. And here's, here's kind of a good snapshot of where they're at, verse 21, but we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Ah, there it is. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, right? We thought, oh, hang on. There we go, sorry. Unplanned moment, rewind the tape a little bit. I'm just kidding. So here they are, we were hoping that it was Jesus who was going to deliver or redeem Israel. Their hopes were dashed because what they thought Jesus was going to do, Jesus didn't do. And what, honestly, what this is a case of, this is a case of improper expectations. For all intents and purposes, what they're saying is, we thought Jesus was going to do one thing, and he didn't do that, so we've lost hope. Careful, Christian right? Because see, we talk all the time about Jesus has got a plan, right? Jesus has got a will. Jesus is going to work a certain, a certain way. And we, without maybe meaning to, we kind of automatically assume we know what that is. And then when it doesn't happen, our hopes are dashed. But it's not because he did anything wrong. It's because we had an improper expectation, they say, I mean, and, and let's face it, their hope is actually, in a sense, accurate because they thought well, Jesus was going to redeem Israel. He did, not the way they thought. See, what they were looking for was a political Messiah. They thought the Messiah was going to come in and was going to deal with the corrupt Roman government, and finally, the Jews would be in charge and everything would be cool. That's what they thought. Now, none of us as Christians would ever make the mistake of thinking that what God wants to do is somehow deal with the corrupt government, right? And if he would just put the right people in charge, Christians would be fine. None of us would ever think that. Never. Oh, man, we do it all the time. Can I say this? I don't mean this in a frivolous, reckless sort of way. I just honestly believe deep in my heart that God is a lot more concerned with the kingdom that he's building than the United States of America. The United States of America doesn't factor into the kingdom of God. We're not the promised land. In fact, if anything, we kind of, it certainly seems from like our study through the book of Revelation, we just kind of pass from the scene. We're not really mentioned in end time stuff. It all seems to happen somewhere else. All these other places become the focus of end time stuff. Point is that, look, it could even be in relationships. We could think, oh, I met this person and, you know, uh, this, is, this is God's will. And we pray about it. And then the relationship ends. 
and our hopes are dashed because I was hoping that God was going to do this. And look, I speak from personal experience. Not many of you know this, but I was engaged once before me and Amanda got married to another person, right? I was engaged, I met this person, and I thought, here's, here's how it happened. I'll just lay out the story for you. So I'm a young guy, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a youth pastor on staff at a church one day, and by the way, when you're a young guy in ministry, you are everybody's project for setting up with a young female. <laughs> Everybody. I mean, I kid you not, a young, a young girl would come to church, and the other assistant pastors, I'd be talking to the girl, and the other assistant pastors would walk behind her and go, hey, I saw you talking to so-and-so. Hey, Kevin, I've got this friend I'd like you to meet. If you want to know how your friends see you, go on a blind date that they set you up on. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I, getting, I, 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 I think it's a Saturday. It was a Saturday. I'd worked at the church, and I never do stuff on a Saturday night because I get up really early for church on Sundays. So I worked on a Saturday, and a friend of mine was like, hey, I got a spare ticket to the Braves game. Do you want to go? He's like, I'm going with a bunch of people from my church because he went to a different church. I was like, sure, I'll go. So I go home, and I'm changing to get ready to go. And I was like, Lord, and it's one of those flare prayers. Lord, let me meet a girl tonight and let her be my wife. That was my prayer. So I go to the baseball game, and I end up sitting next to this young gal, and I think, this is it. Praise God. <laughs> we get engaged. I'm not making this up. We get engaged. Go all the way through premarital counseling, right? All the wedding plans are made. The invitations are sent out. The dresses are purchased. The tuxedos are rented three days before the ceremony. I called it off. I know all you're like, oh, poor Kevin. I was hoping that the Lord was going to do this. How many times in relationships have we said, Lord, let me meet this person. Let me meet this person. Lord, let that person be the person. Instead of praying and saying, God, do you even want me to get married? We just assume, well, I'm a Christian. I'm single. God's will for my life must be to get married. Maybe not. Have you asked him? See what I'm saying? That's just the expectation of God is, well, that, that must be. How do you know if you haven't asked? We bash the government instead of praying for the government. And honoring the king. We speak so disrespectfully nowadays. And I'm talking about in the church. And it doesn't matter to me who the president is. But you and I, as Christians, as children of God, we speak so disrespectfully of whoever occupies the office of the president of the United States of America instead of doing what the Bible says, which is honor the king. Not because you like him, but because God's word. I mean, think about when Paul wrote that. This was during the Roman government. He said, show honor to the king. That's what we're called to do, guys. You know how bad of a witness it is when you and I as Christians are disrespectful to those in leadership? That does not set a good example for the world. Things like social justice. That's a big buzzword right now in Christian circles. And look, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be concerned with things like feeding the homeless, and all that kind of stuff. All I'm saying is, is that Jesus Christ never once called for social reform. Never. What he did was call for the radical transformation of every individual heart, and that would end up in a transformed society. And if we as the church would come back to our mission, which is the gospel, and telling people about Jesus, that's what people need to hear. But we get into this mode just like these disciples. All this stuff's happening, and I built up this expectation. And in reality, that's not God's plan at all. And here's Jesus, back alive from the dead, talking to them. And they're like, man, we were hoping. <laughs> wow. It's a pretty interesting picture. 
We were hoping, verse 21, it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, verse 22, and now they're just kind of catching them up. And certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us when they did not find his body and came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And in verse 25, Jesus says to them, fools. Now, I mean, the translation has cleaned it up a little bit. Oh, foolish ones. But it's fools. He's listening to them talk. He's listening to them go on about the account. And he just looks at him and he says, you fools. You've completely missed it. But look at why. Look at why. This is so insightful. Look what Jesus says. Oh, foolish ones, and I have this underlined in my Bible, and slow of heart to believe. See, the problem wasn't an intellectual problem. They literally knew everything that had happened. They had a familiarity with the Old Testament. They had followed Jesus. They knew uh, all the miracles that he had performed. They knew about his betrayal, his arrest, his scourging, his crucifixion. They knew he'd been, he was dead and he was buried. They knew all of it. They were able to give an up-close and personal recounting of all the information to Jesus. But here's what Jesus says. It's your heart that's sluggish. Slow of heart to believe. You see, their minds, they knew all the information, but their heart was completely disengaged. This is why I think it was them who, because of where they were at, their eyes were restrained and they did not know him. Because remember what scripture tells us? We walk by faith, not by sight, right? They're, they don't believe. Their hearts aren't believing. And because their hearts aren't believing, what are they doing? They're walking by sight. They've seen everything. And this can be us as Christians. I mean, it's, look, it's, don't, you think, don't you know that it's true? We love to walk by sight and call it faith. As long as I can see everything, right, I have plenty of faith. As long as I can understand everything, I have plenty of faith. But the minute stuff starts to happen that I did not foresee, that I did not know was going to happen, I'm like these guys. My hopes are dashed. But a lot of times it's not because God has somehow done something wrong. It's because my heart is not where it needs to be. It's my heart that is slow and sluggish and disengaged. I'm a mindful Christian but my heart isn't filled with faith. And Jesus says to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Now watch verse 27. I love this. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, Jesus expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. What a Bible study that must have been. You know what I mean? Wouldn't you like to like order a copy of that one? Oh, I heard the study was really good on Wednesday night. Can I? Where can I find a copy of it? Here's Jesus Christ, and I don't look. I don't think he's got a, like a couple of scrolls tucked under, under his arm. But Jesus Christ is walking along with them, and they're telling him everything that's going on. And he looks at him. He says, "Look, foolish ones, you're you're slow of heart to believe." And he goes all the way back to Genesis, and he starts going through Genesis and brings it all the way up to the New Testament, expounding to them in scriptures the things concerning himself. That he was the seed of the woman, right? The proto-evangelicum mentioned all the way back in Genesis chapter 3 that the serpent would bruise his heel and he would crush the serpent's head, that he's the lion of the tribe of Judah, that he's the lily of the valley, that he's the love of the Song of Solomon, that he's the wisdom of the Proverbs, that he's the princely Messiah and the prophet Daniel. He just goes all the way through it. 
And we say, well, yeah, I, I know the Bible. I know the Bible. Really? I mean, so you can walk along with someone and just, boom, go from Genesis chapter 37 all the way up to Genesis chapter 50 and explain to everybody in there where Jesus is in all of that. Oh, well, no, I, I can't really do that. But we need to be able to. Because what, look, don't overlook this. Okay, this is, let me just break this down really simple. You've got two people here who know all the right answers, but they don't see Jesus. And what Jesus diagnoses them with is a slowness of heart. There's no faith. So what does he do? Does he kind of like pull some pixie dust out of his, this is what people want. People come for counseling, and they say, oh, Kevin, you know, we're in this major problem, and we've been in this problem for all these years, and what can you do for us? And they think I'm going to go, and it's, oh, we met for counseling. That's it. We're done. No, 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 no. You know what the answer is? The answer is the Word of God. We're always looking for something other than the Word of God. These disciples have a slowness of heart to believe. There's a lack of faith. They've got it all up here. And what Jesus does for them, he doesn't perform a miracle. He doesn't, like, rip the blinders from their eyes. What he does is he says, Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he brings it all the way up. And in that, the blindness is lifted from their eyes. Their hearts begin to burn as he expounds the word to them. Why? Because faith comes by hearing and by hearing the word of God. This feeds our faith. Christians nowadays, man, the church nowadays, we are so obsessed with finding that magic, elusive thing other than the Bible. That conference, that devotion, that course, that speaker, that retreat, that counselor, that medication, whatever it might be, we're always looking for something that's the answer instead of taking advantage of the thing that builds our faith the most, which is the word of God. And I love that Jesus Christ, inseparable from the Holy Spirit, that he himself, one with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit being the one who authors the scriptures, that Jesus Christ just begins to walk with these guys and just begins to expound the scripture to them. The word for expound, David Guzik talks about this in his commentary. It's a word that literally means to stick close to the text. That's what every Bible teacher should really aim to do. Here again, we're always kind of looking for the speaker who's got like the best stories or the best allegory or the best anecdote, right? Who will kind of keep me entertained instead of the speaker who will just stick to the text and let the text speak for itself so that my heart, which is built in faith from the word of God, will be fed so that I will go out these doors once again, not being a Christian who walks by sight and has all the understanding up here, but who is someone who understands, I just met the Lord. I just had an encounter with Jesus, and the Holy Spirit just ministered the Word of God to me in a supernatural way, and now where I had been sad and my hopes had been dashed, I, I now suddenly see the way I couldn't see before, because now I'm not walking by sight, I'm walking by faith. And I'm believing, not because I understand, but because I'm filled with faith. And I'm believing, not because I've had every question answered or all my hopes filled, but because I met Jesus. Jesus just begins to go through it and expound all these things to them in Scripture about the things concerning himself. It's like Jesus himself declares in Hebrews chapter 10, in the volume of the book, it is written of me. This whole thing is about Jesus. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther, but they constrained him. They don't want him to go away. 
saying, Abide with us, for it's toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them, and it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. And watch this, boom, their eyes were opened, and they knew him. Two Christians walking along. I mean, it sounds like a joke, right? Two Christians are walking along one day talking about Christian things. And then Jesus walks up and they don't recognize him. And then Jesus does a Bible study with them and boom, their eyes are opened. Wow, that's what church ought to be. Church ought to be, man, I've gone through this week and I've become pessimistic and I've kind of, you know, had my hopes dashed and things at work didn't go the way that I thought they were going to go and I, things at home aren't going the way that I thought they were going to go or things with my health or my kids, they, they're not necessarily go. This is not the plan that I thought God had. And then Jesus, in the Spirit, ministers the Word of God to us and we go out and we're like, whoa, whoa, I can see again. Because I met Christ and I had an encounter with Christ. That ought to be church. That ought to be every day of our lives. Just walking with the Lord, allowing the Holy Spirit to illuminate the scriptures to us so that our eyes are opened and we know him. Their eyes were opened and they knew him. Now, what was it exactly that happened in the process of Jesus breaking bread that their eyes are open? I have no idea. All kinds of speculation, right? People have said that maybe Jesus had a certain prayer that he prayed. Maybe there was a certain way that he broke the bread, because remember, he was with the disciples. And there's a few times in the, in the gospel accounts where Jesus broke bread. So maybe, maybe when he broke the bread, they saw the scars on his hand. I don't know. But for whatever reason, in this, listen, communion setting, something supernatural happened. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him. And what happens? Boom, Jesus is gone, vanishes from their sight. And they said to one another in verse 32, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? Check this out, verse 33. So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem. Remember how far it was? To Jerusalem, it was seven miles. Seven miles. These guys have been walking along. Their hopes are dashed. We thought it was going to be Jesus. And then Jesus meets them. He opens the scripture to them. And they, they, reach the, the, they reach the village at the end of the day. And Jesus is like, you know, I'm going to keep going. They're like, no, 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 no. Come on in. Come in and have a meal. They come in. Jesus comes in, has a meal with them. Which, by the way, it's a beautiful picture of what we read about in the book of Revelation. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears and opens unto me, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. That's what Jesus wants with you. He wants fellowship. So Jesus is now sitting with these two disciples who have heard the word of God. Jesus does this thing, whatever it was, with communion, and their eyes are open. Boom! And they turn to each other, and they're like, oh, when he was talking about the word of God, didn't your heart just like, they had been sad, right? That's what Jesus, that's the state they were in when Jesus met him. They were sad. They were hopeless. And they're like, our hearts burned when he talked about the word of God. Come on. We got to go back six miles or seven miles. They go back to Jerusalem and found the 11, verse 33. And those who were with them gathered together saying, the Lord is risen and has appeared to Simon. Now, this is funny to me because earlier in the account, right, these two people on the road to Emmaus, they were part of that group whom the women had gone to the tomb and came back. And they're like, the Lord's not there. He's risen. We saw two angels. And they're like, nonsense. And now these two guys come in and they're like, the Lord's risen. The ladies are probably like, that's what we told you. <laughs> it's exactly what we said, right? The Lord is risen. And it says, verse 35, they told about the things that happened on the road. See, you're on a road, right? You're walking through this life. You're traveling. I hate to use this term because it's overused in church circles nowadays, but you're on a journey. Jesus is going to meet you in a certain way, and he's going to do a certain thing. That's what you go tell people. 
the result of Jesus drawing near and ministering to us in our lives personally, the result of that should be, boom, I can see, I understand, my heart is filled with this burning desire to go, even if it means I have to travel seven miles out of my way so that I can tell people about what Jesus Christ has done in my life. They told about the things that happened on the road and how he was known to them. Or check this out. You know what that word is for known to them? Recognized. How he was recognized in communion. Remember where we started? Their eyes were restrained. We talked about the people in Mark chapter 6 who when they saw Jesus, they recognized him. Not these two disciples. Their eyes were restrained. They didn't recognize him, but now they do. How? Through fellowship with Jesus, through the expounding of the scriptures, and through communion. Many times people wonder why we do what we do here. How come we don't do that? How come we don't do that? How come we don't do that? We do what we do here because we genuinely believe this is how the Spirit of God works, through the expounding of the Scriptures, through the breaking of bread in communion, through providing, if I can use this term without it sounding, or without being misinterpreted, an opportunity, a setting for you to come in and just meet the Lord. That's what we do. This morning, we're going to close out with a time of communion. Now, look, when we do this, as we do this, and y'all, y'all can go ahead and come on up. Um, I don't, I don't, we're, so often what happens is we go, oh, okay, well, the sermon's over, we're done. No, we're not. It's not like we're going to lock the doors and make you stay in here, but, but man, this right now, this, this is our response time. This is our opportunity to now, having heard the word of God, for the seed of the word been thrown out onto the soil of our hearts, now's the opportunity to respond. And you know, I not long after I moved here, we did an invitation and nobody came forward. And somebody made the comment to me. They said, Well, we're we're just not the church that does that. I don't care. I really don't care because we're doing it today. And we're not, I'm not a big believer in let's tug on the heartstrings and, you know, we're just going to give you an opportunity. Communion is here. This was when they recognized Jesus. He was known to them in communion. I cannot explain it to you, but something happens in communion. When we take the bread, we take the cup, and we remember the sacrifice of, Christ, sacrifice of Christ. Something happens. Something happens when we expound the scriptures. I can't explain it to you. I just know that it does. Something happens when we worship. I can't explain it to you. I just know that it does. We're going to dim those lights. We're all going to stand. Let's stand. We're going to have some worship. And I, this whole altar is going to be open this morning. And I, I want you to not care what anyone in this room thinks as you worship Jesus right now. I want you to not be concerned with what anybody thinks about whether you're the person who comes down here and kneels because you need to have some time alone with Jesus. I want you to go and have communion. Because something happens, and I don't know what it is. I don't know how it works, but I just know Jesus is here this morning. And like these two disciples on the road to Emmaus, he is drawing near, but my question is, are there some of us in the room today who we've got it all up here? But even this whole time that we've been talking, we're still sitting here going, I don't see it. And here's my encouragement as we bow our heads and close our eyes. And we begin to worship. Hey, if you're here this morning and you're not somebody who needs to come down front, then here's what you do. You start praying for people in this room. 
And you start praying for the Spirit of God to work. Father, we give you this time and we recognize in faith that you're here. We can't see you. The Spirit's like the wind. We can't tell where it's coming from or where it's going to go. We just see the evidence of it. And Father, I believe this morning that your Spirit's at work in people's hearts and we set aside this time. We invite you now to come and draw people to yourself and minister and open eyes and fill hearts with a burning passion, faith, to share the gospel and to know you more intimately. We give you this time, Jesus. It's in your name we pray.